start with our motivation. <clears throat> so when we take refuge in the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, there are several different factors and motivations involved. One is concern about being born in again in samsara and specifically in the unfortunate realms but really uh, some dread of that some not wanting that to happen and so to seek a way out of it uh, we take refuge in the buddha dharma and sangha but that alone isn't enough of a motivation to take refuge we also need to have to know what the Buddha, Dharma, Sangha are and to have faith in them. So knowledge of their qualities, how they benefit us, and so on, that's really important. Otherwise, we're, uh, we know we need, it's like somebody who's sick and they know they need medicine, but they'll grab any medicine without checking out if it's the proper medicine for their disease. So we have to know what the Buddha Dharma Sangha is and before and have faith in its qualities before taking refuge. And then as Mahayana practitioners too, it's important when we take refuge that we do so with the motivation of compassion for all living beings. In other words, we're not just seeking a remedy to our own personal samsara, but we have a very large and broad uh, perspective and goal in mind. And we want to become a Buddha so we can guide all living beings out of samsara. And so with that kind of compassionate, altruistic motivation, then we seek refuge in the three jewels uh, who will help us develop the qualities that we need in order to fulfill our wish for the well-being of all living beings. So when we uh, have teachings, it's important to take refuge and generate bodhicitta. And you can see that in some respects, uh, these two come to the same point. Yeah, so that we're clear about our spiritual goals and why we want to go in those directions. And thus, we're clear about who we're relying on to guide us. So with that motivation and also refuge in the three jewels, then let's listen to the <coughs> Dharma this evening. So when we chant the refuge prayer, how often do we stop and think of these factors that need to be involved for actually taking refuge? Or do we just go, I take refuge, tamasanga? You know? Uh, do we really think about what the Buddha Dharma Sangha are and why we're seeking refuge in them? Yeah, because this is, you know, how we re begin all of our sadhanas, all of our teachings, everything begins with refuge in bodhicitta. Yeah, so it's important that we really focus on that and understand the meaning yeah, and have the correct intention in our mind. And it's interesting because, you know, we take refuge out of concern for lower life, you know, lower rebirths, and out of, um, you know, out of the wish not to suffer, basically, yeah? And so we're trying to have 
the perspective of not suffering from all of samsara and specifically not suffering from the the unfortunate realms but how often do does that even come into our mind that we don't want those kinds of sufferings yeah so when we take refuge do we really have even the first factor of it or when we think about you know uh, preventing suffering or seeking a refuge from suffering are we thinking about uh, you know the suffering of having food we don't like the suffering of a government that doesn't function the suffering of being in a truck car accident the suffering of uh, you know your child not doing what you want them to do yeah, when we think of taking refuge from suffering, what suffering are we really concerned with? Yeah, so the question then arises, are we actually taking refuge in the Buddha Dharma Sangha? Yeah, do we, when we have a problem, turn to the Buddha Dharma Sangha for a remedy? Or do we turn to the refrigerator for a remedy? You know, because what do we do often when we have a problem and we're stressed out? We go to the refrigerator, you know. So I always joke that in America, our three jewels of refuge, you know, let's see if I can remember them. I haven't said them in a long time. Yeah, our credit card, our the refrigerator was one of them. What else did I have? Television. Yeah, television or entertainment, yeah. Okay, so I think our credit card's got to be Buddha. You know, that's what we worship the most. And then entertainment, music, TV, all this stuff, that would be the Dharma. That's, yeah, and relationships. And then uh, the, the third one would either be the refrigerator or our car. Yeah, okay. And so that's what we often turn to. Uh, you know, some people have a variety of it when they're, when they're suffering. You know, it could be instead of the refrigerator, it could be a joint, it could be a beer, it could be whiskey, it could be going to the casino, it could be going to the shopping center. It could be, you know, whatever we do to distract ourselves. And And so it's interesting to ask, you know, do we really take refuge or not? You know, especially when we have a problem and we have a difficult and we have difficulty. Yeah, it's an interesting question to ask. <clears throat> okay, and and even you know when we're we're thinking more deeply about things, uh, do we take refuge in psychology? Or do we take refuge in self-help books? Uh, or, you know, any number of other things that are very good and very helpful. But are they the objects of refuge if we're calling ourselves a Buddhist? And if our aim is liberation? Yeah, so if our aim is liberation, you know... These other fields and disciplines, which are very good and they help human suffering, but they don't lead to liberation or awakening. Yeah. But we go, we go often to them when we have problems. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's an interesting thing just to, to kind of think about and examine our own mind and, and check up. Mm -hmm. Okay, so last, uh, before the trip, no, last week I taught, yeah, then we were uh, talking about the three kinds, the three levels of dependency. Okay, so we talked about how His Holiness was, uh, discusses the three levels of refuge, First of all, beginning with uh, three levels of dependent arising, beginning with 
to causal dependence and then dependent designation, and then dividing dependent designation into two, uh, mutual dependence and mere dependent designation. Okay? And so we talked about causal uh, dependence last time. That's how effects depends on cause causes. And so this is something... <clears throat> that we just accept in life. We grew up with it. We, un, you know, we look around. We know that you have to create the causes in order to get the effect. Yeah, we know that up here. Do we always create the cause, causes to get the effects? No, we want the effects to appear magically. Don't we? Yeah, we want the effects to come without the causes. Um so it's interesting, isn't it, how we believe in cause and effect. And to some extent, we live our life according it, to it. We eat because we know that eating brings the effect of alleviating hunger. Okay, you go to school because you know it brings the effect of hopefully being able to get a job. Yeah, which brings the effect of hopefully making some money. Which brings the effect of maybe being happy. Okay. Um, so we have that, but then in other things in our life, we just want the result to come without creating causes. For example, um, we want to have friends without uh, learning how to be a good friend to somebody else. Yeah? How often do we think, you know, am I creating the qualities in myself so that I can be a good friend to somebody? Or do we just think, yeah, oh, I like that person, I want them to like me. And you get what I'm saying? Yeah? Or we just expect people to like us, or we expect to have good friends, but we don't really check up if we're being a good friend to somebody else. Or we want friends, let's say, who have good ethical conduct, but if we don't have good ethical conduct, why, should, why would such people be attracted to us as a friend? Yeah. Or, you know, we, we want to have good friends, yeah, who bring out the best in us, and then we make friends with people who drink and drug, and then we start drinking and drugging. Okay? So it's, it's an interesting situation how... You know, we know about cause and effect. We know that effects depend on causes. But we often don't apply that to our life. Yeah? We want the result without putting forth the effort to create the cause. Okay? So similarly, you know, I mean, in uh, you want a good relationship with your boss at work. But do you try to be a good employee? You know? Or do we just say, oh, well, I'm doing my work so automatically the boss should like us. But meanwhile, we're, you know, taking things from the company and we're, uh, you know, writing down hours that we haven't worked uh, so that we get paid for what we haven't done and so on and so forth. And yet we want the, the boss to trust us and to think we're a good, a good employee. But we don't create the cause for that. Okay, so, um, yeah, so just even thinking about cause, you know, cause and effect is, is quite powerful for us, you know, to ask ourselves, you know, do I really believe in it, you know? We want to have good health, yeah? Do we create the causes for good health? Yeah, do we eat properly? Do we have a proper weight? Do we exercise yeah, we want that result, but we want it to happen, you know, while we have uh, all sorts of goodies. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, uh, yeah, so some good contemplation on cause and effect is, is very important, you know, for just thinking about how we live our life, for consideration of karma and its effects, 
you know, so how we live our life, the kinds of causes to gain certain results in this life, and then karma and its effects, what do we do now to create the causes for the kind of lives we, we want to have in the future? Yeah, and then also thinking about cause and effect in in terms of how it shows that things lack any substantial nature or any inherent existence. Yeah, so that's a whole deeper way of looking at cause and effect. Yeah, and so that that can be very interesting to do because you know uh, when you look. At a cause, yeah, okay, the seed produces the sprout, we know that, okay, but, and it makes sense and we accept it and we think of the seed as inherently existent and the sprout as inherently existent and the arising, the process of one arising from the other as inherently existent and that's fine, but... When you scratch a little bit and ask yourself a little bit deeply, more deep, no, more deeply, it's an adverb, isn't it? Um, then you have to say, what is it in the cause that produces the effect? So what in the seed produces the sprout? Okay. Now, can you, when you look at the seed, can you think of any single thing in the seed that makes it the cause of the sprout? You know, that's a bit hard, isn't it? Now, do you say it's the DNA in the central, the nucleus? Does the seed have a nucleus? What is it? The core. It has. I've forgotten all my fifth grade biology. The cells have nucleus. The cells have nucleus, but the seed, the seed, you know, has, you know, is there something inside that seed that it itself is what produces the sprout? Or inside the seed, there's a whole bunch of things, yeah. Uh, different elements, you know, hydrogen and carbon and oxygen and all those kinds of things. Do any of those produce the sprout? No. When you look at exactly what the seed is, do you see? Do you see anything that produces the sprout? Yeah. It becomes, you can't, can you? You can't isolate anything. And when you look at the seed, what is that cause? And you break it down, you know, there's just a bunch of elements from the periodic chart in it. Okay? And none of the elements are a seed, and none of those elements are a sprout either. So you have a bunch of things in that seed that are not a seed and that are not a sprout, and yet they can produce a sprout. Doesn't that sound like magic? Yeah? You have a bunch of non-sprouts coming together, and together they produce a sprout. Because you have a seed, you have water, you have fertilizer. None of those things are a sprout. And out of non-sprouts, a sprout appears. Doesn't that seem like magic? When you really think about it. Because we can't identify exactly how that happens. And yet we know it happens. Okay? So that inability to find exactly what the cause is or exactly what in the cause brings the result or only finding things that are not the result coming together to produce the sprout, 
all those things are indicative of the emptiness of the sprout and, by extension, the emptiness of the seed. Yeah. So it's very interesting to spend some time, you know, really thinking about this and how causality works. And if we think about the, um, you know, the 12 links of dependent arising, how does ignorance give rise to formative actions or the, the karma that has the power to produce a rebirth? Yeah. How does that happen? Because if you had inherently existent ignorance and inherently existent karma, they, could, they wouldn't, would be totally unrelated. Yeah, be ignorance here and karma here. Like it would be the seed here and the sprout here. And there's no connection between them. And yet, that's not it. There's, there's a causal defend, dependence. But we can't pinpoint exactly what it is. Yeah, in fact, we can't pinpoint anything. You can't really find the seed that is ceasing, and you can't really find, and you definitely can't find the sprout that is in the process of arising. Okay? So it really, uh, it makes us think. You know, when we examine causality deeply like this, it uh, brings out the, uh, you know, the empty nature. It makes the empty nature appear, appear to us more readily because we see that things are not self-enclosed entities with their own identities there. Um. Okay, so that's that's causal dependence. Then, um, with, under dependent designation, the first one was mutual dependence, and so this is the thing, the point that you po- that we posit things in terms of other things. In other words, something doesn't have its own identity, independent of the things around it. Okay, it, that nothing has its own identity independent of anything else because things are posited in relationship. There is short because there's long. There's small because there's big. There's employer because there's employee. There's parents because there's child. There's child because there's parents. There's cause before, because there's effect. There's effect because there's cause. Okay? There's poor and rich posited together. Okay? And like I was saying about Amitabha's Pure Land, if you say there's no women there, then how can you say there's men there? Because those two need to be posited in relationship to each other. Okay? So... You know, this is very interesting for for looking at how we identify ourselves, what identities we hold on to in our lives, and to see how those identities are things that are posited <clears throat> in relationship to other things in society. Yeah? So... We call ourselves whatever nationality we are because there's people of other nationalities. Yeah, if there weren't people of other nationalities, we wouldn't have our nationality. Okay. Um, You know, anything, any qualities that we hang on to, uh, you know, our ethnicity or our religion, yeah, those are all posited because 
there's other ethnicities and other religions. Okay? So it's not like, you know, our, we are this certain ethnicity independent of everything else. Yeah? We're only called that because <clears throat> there's other things, you know, that are in the same category that are called with other names. Okay? So it's quite interesting, really, to, to look at our identity and our question our identity and see how so much of it is really just dependent on things that are not us. <laughs> yeah? Isn't that crazy that you find your... I, you create identities based on things that are not you. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. And, and then to think of how much we cling to those identities. And we don't like it when people think we're an identity that we aren't. It's quite interesting. You know, if you identify as one race and somebody thinks you belong to another race. Yeah. Nowadays in identity politics, then you get really mad. Yeah. So I am this race. Or I am this ethnicity. I am whatever it is. Yeah. And sexuality too. If you're straight and somebody thinks you're you're gay, you're offended. If, so, if you're gay and somebody thinks you're straight, you're also offended, you know, because we hold on to those identities very strongly. And yet they're just things that are posited in relationship to each other. They don't exist by themselves. They don't have any nature there in and of themselves that make them what they are. Yeah, they're just names that are attached to things that, you know, are posited in mutual dependence. So, more examples of things that are posited uh, or things that exist in mutual dependence. Um, agent, action, agent and action. Yeah, and object too. The person who acts, the action they do, the object they're acting upon. Yeah, like we say baseball player, okay? So-and-so's a baseball player. Yeah. Now, we can only say they're a baseball player because there's baseballs and there's baseball games, okay? If there weren't baseballs and there weren't baseball games, we wouldn't have baseball players, but when we see somebody and we say they're a baseball player, they may not be pay playing baseball at that moment, but we still identify them as a baseball player. Yeah, but they're not a baseball. They're actually not a baseball player at that moment. Yeah, they're just being posited as a baseball player, because there are baseball games and baseballs, and there's the chance for them to actually participate with a ball in a game. Okay. But, you know, if, it's strange, isn't it? We call them a baseball player when they're not playing baseball. As if baseball player is some objective entity that's implanted in them like a computer chip or something so that they're always a baseball player even when they're not playing baseball. Okay? Now, if, if they were inherently a baseball player, okay, then they should always be playing baseball. They should never be doing anything else. They should always play baseball. And they can never have any other name attached. They could never be a father or a mother. 
Okay, they couldn't have any other identities because they are inherently a baseball player who is always playing baseball. But it's because things conventionally exist, and here I'm getting into dependent designation, you know, mere dependent designation. It's because, you know, uh, things are merely designated that they can be called a baseball player when they're not playing baseball. Yeah. So that's why conventional reality is kind of sloppy. Because when you look at it, we can't say they're a baseball player when they're sleeping or when they're eating. Yeah. And when do they become a baseball player? When they put on the uniform? Yeah. If they don't wear a uniform but they're on the diamond, are they a baseball player? If they're wearing the uniform, but they're sitting in the dugout, are they a baseball player? Yeah. So what exactly is a baseball player? You know, it's just what we happen to designate <laughs> as a baseball player based on certain criteria that we cannot adhere to too stringently. Because if we adhere to, adhere to those criteria too stringently, then we're getting into inherent existence. Okay? Like that sand that blows from this side of the fence to the other side. It, which country is that sand? Yeah, in which country? It's here, in Israel, you know? So it's Israeli. Then the wind blows, and now it's Jordan. And then the wind blows again, and it becomes Israel. And then, you know, what is it? Okay. So if things inherently existed, it would something would have a particular identity and not be able to change that identity at all. Okay. Um, similar posited in terms of, um, uh, you know, mutual dependence are the object, the sense power or sense faculty, and the consciousness. Yeah, so there's a visual object, color and shape. There is a sense faculty, so the, uh, we would probably say the rods and cones on the back of our retina. And then there's the visual consciousness that sees something. And the way we look at it is there's the visual consciousness sitting there as some thing, being a visual consciousness, yeah, waiting to perceive something even when it's not perceiving something, like we're asleep. Yeah, there's the, the sense faculty, you know, like the rods and cones, and they're not, you know, connecting the object to the consciousness at that moment. They're just sitting there, yet we still think that they're a sense faculty. And then here's the, per the perceivable object, the color and shape, out there, just hanging around, being an object, waiting to be perceived. And so we think of these three as each one of them has their own identity, and they're just hanging around, waiting for something to connect them so that that causal process happens and we can see the object. Okay, that's how we look at it. But in actual fact, you know, there's a causal process going on. So, you know, the, the visual consciousness is the effect of the object and the, uh, and the faculty. But also, these things being posited as a consciousness and a faculty and an object you know, are posited in relationship to each other. 
Yeah. It isn't like there's a visual consciousness that's just hanging out somewhere without an object. Yeah. And it's not like there's an object out out there, you know, existing in and of itself that's never perceived by anybody or anything. Yeah. And same with the 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 faculty, you know. So it's it's interesting to spend some time and think about how we think about things and whether that is actually how they are. Okay, like another one. This one I think is really interesting. Fuel and fire. And here I'm going a little bit in into uh, mere dependent designation, so I'm jumping ahead of myself. But I was thinking about this this afternoon. So, fuel and fire. So we usually say fuel is the cause of fire. Right? Okay. So that would mean that fuel exists before the fire. Right? But fuel is defined as that which fire burns. That sounds like a good definition of fuel. That which is burnt by fire. That which fire burns. Okay? Now, when the fuel, we, we have logs, okay? You have a log here. You know, and, and we have our, our heating system, you know, the fire here. When the log is not in the fire... Is it actually fuel? Because fuel is that which is burned by fire, but that log is not being burned by fire at that moment. It's outside the, the furnace. Okay. So before it's burnt, it's not really fuel. After it's burnt, and there's just ashes there, is it fuel? No. And you go, ah, then it must be fuel when it is being burnt. Okay? But when it is being burnt, it's fire. When you put the log into the fire, and it catches fire, yeah, then the fuel becomes the fire. So it can't still be fuel. It's become fire. So when actually does the fuel exist? It doesn't exist in the, before it's in the fire. It doesn't exist after it's burnt. And it doesn't exist while it's burning either. Interesting to think about, isn't it? Yeah. And yet, we believe there's fuel. And we say fuel causes fire. Okay, so think about that one a little bit. <laughs> yeah, quite interesting. Because, you know, the fuel and the fire look very, very inherent existent, each with its own identity, each with its own function. And yet, what's the fuel? Okay, so all these things are indicative of things not having their own entity. Okay? 
Another thing that I think it's very important to, to realize is that what we call destructive karma and constructive karma or negative karma and positive karma, these two are posited in relationship to each other. And they're posited in terms of the results that they bring. So it's not that any particular action is inherently negative. It is posited as negative because it brings a suffering result. If that same action brought a happy result, it would be posited as positive karma. So it's not, you know, inherently negative. And the Buddha didn't make up the list of the ten non-virtues. He didn't say, thou shalt not do this because I'm saying it's bad, and if I say it's bad, it must be bad and negative, and it's my saying so that makes it negative karma. No, the Buddha didn't invent or do any of that. It's just he saw, okay, when sentient beings experience happiness, those causes were called virtue. And when they, you know, virtuous actions, when they experience suffering, those causes were called non-virtuous. Okay? So I think that's very important for us to think about because sometimes our minds get very locked into virtue and non-virtue and good and bad and thou shalt not and thou shalt. And, you know, we get very concrete and very judgmental as a result of that. Okay? When in fact... All these things are posited in relationship to their effects and posited in relationship to each other. Okay? So thinking like that loosens the mind a little bit. Yeah? If you tend to get uptight about, you know, when you think about karma and you tend to get a little stressed and uptight, then remember that, you know, things are positive and negative because of the result that they bring, not because somebody said so or inside of them they have some findable inherent evil. Not like that. Okay? And so... That, that also helps when we find ourselves getting judgmental because we judge other people, you know. They're doing good, they're doing bad, they're right, they're wrong, you know, they're neat, they're messy, they're, you know, this, they're kind, they're mean. Yeah. To realize that all these labels, and you know, terms that we apply to other people are don't you know they don't exist in those people yeah we're just looking at certain behavior in a particular way and then calling it good behavior or bad behavior yeah okay it's same like neat and messy yeah some people may look at their 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 desk and say, oh, my desk is really neat. And somebody else may come by and say, what a mess your desk is. Yeah? Because people have different standards and those things, you know, exist in relationship to each other. Okay, so here's a quote by Chandakirti. Uh, those are established through mutual dependence. When reliable cognizers exist, then there are things that are the objects of comprehension. When there are things that are objects of comprehension, then there are reliable cognizers. However, neither reliable cognizers nor objects of comprehension exist inherently. Wow! 
you know, because we, the way we look at it is, well, if we're going to call something an object of comprehension, yeah, there's got to be this reliable cognizer that's already a reliable cognizer. There's an inherently existent reliable cognizer out there that then perceives an inherently existent reliable object. Yeah? And they're both out there waiting for each other. Yeah, this reliable object wanting a reliable cognizer and this reliable cognizer seeking a reliable object. And they're both inherently existent, waiting to be brought, to, brought together. Okay? That's how we look at it. But it's not like that. This becomes a, an existent reality object, you know, an object of comprehension, a reliable object, because there's a reliable cognizer that knows it. Not because in and of itself, you know, it has some special status of existence. And this becomes a reliable cognizer because there's an object of comprehension that exists, you know, that it's cognizing. Yeah. Uh -huh. So they become what they are in relationship to each other. They don't exist out there waiting to encounter each other. So somebody asked about emptiness and inherent existence, and do they exist in mutual dependence on each other? Inherent existence does not exist. Yeah, that was their second question. <laughs> Inherent existence does not exist. When we're realizing emptiness, we're realizing the way things have always existed. We're not changing the way they exist when we realize emptiness. It isn't like there was inherent existence, and then when we realize emptiness, inherent existence disappears. It never existed at all. So they're not an example of mutual dependence? You could, you know, in one way you could say they're posited in relationship to each other because we say the emptiness of inherent existence, you know, because we say inherent existence. But inherent existence doesn't really exist. So difficult to actually, you know, posit anything. So our need for liberation is based on our ignorance. And so would ignorance and liberation be the, the mutually... I think I mean, if you liberation were liberal, and samsara would, would, be would be mutually dependent. Ignorance and wisdom would be mutually dependent. Okay, yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Two questions. Two questions. Then the... I think I already know the answer to this, but but then the emptiness and the conventional object that it is empty of, those are mutually dependent. No. The 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 the, con the conventional object that exists uh -huh. and the emptiness of that conventional object are mutually, are mutually dependent. dependent. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And then my second question is we always hear this in terms of pairs. Mm -hmm. But is it that, or is is there's this whole, I mean, if I think about this very much, then there's this whole tremendous array of dependencies that make all this happen. Oh, yeah. So like, it's not about pairs. It's not a, necessarily. Like, you know, if you talk about um, religions, there's many religions and they're posited in dependence on each other. All of them. Yeah. It's yeah. It's not like, you know... One religion is just posited in terms of one other. It's because there's so many others. And the aspects that make something a religion. Yeah, but that, you know, that is getting into depend, uh, uh, mere dependent designation because on the basis of certain uh, views, 
then you label a particular religion. Okay, now does that mean that everybody who adheres to that religion have those views? Certainly not. Okay, so then what exactly is that religion? And does a religion exist without people who hold that religion and identify with that religion? No, a religion is not some sort of set of beliefs existing in space. There have to be people who identify with that religion. Okay? So when you really think about mutual dependency, there's so many, many, many things involved. Here's a, a quotation from Nagarjuna. Agent depends upon action. So the baseball player depends on you know, the hitting of the baseball, or the playing of the baseball game. Action depends on the agent as well. You can't have a baseball game without players. Apart from dependent arising, one cannot see any cause for their existence. Wow! But, 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 they have their own entity, don't they? Yeah, apart from dependent arising, one cannot see any cause for their existence. How could you say there is a baseball player without a baseball game and a baseball bat and a baseball? You know, you couldn't. Through action and agent, all remaining things should be understood. Okay? Here's... Uh, Jason Kaffa clarifying that. Okay. So we're, here there's a person called Lechen. That's the name of Dharmadatta. Dharma, no. What's his cousin name? Dharmadatta? Devadatta. Devadatta in Tibetan is Lechen. Okay. How about if we call him Harry? <laughs> okay. So Harry... Being an agent depends on action. That is, it comes into existence depending on that. Okay. That which an agent does not perform is not an action. Thus, not only is the agent dependent, but also the action arises, that is, it comes into existence in dependence upon the agent. But apart from that, no inherently existent cause or means is seen. Okay? So tomorrow, Harry is becoming a husband because Megan is becoming a wife. Okay? And Harry is a prince simply because somebody called him one. If they had swapped babies in the hospital, somebody else would be called Prince Harry. But whoever is Prince Harry now might be living, you know, in the suburbs of Nottingham. Okay, so there's nothing, sorry to disappoint all the royals, there is nothing inherent inside a prince or a princess or whatever it is that makes them that. It's just because people call them that. Yeah. And listen to this. This is very interesting. Megan becomes a princess when she is with Harry. Okay, so when she is with Harry, the other royals that are lower in line, lower in number to becoming king or queen, they have to bow to Meghan and to Harry when she's with him. But when she's not with him, she is no longer a princess. <gasps> 
and she has to bow to those other people. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but this is the rules that human beings made up about how your status works. Yeah? Do you mean if they break up or if, if he leaves the room? It sounded like, from what I read, like if he's not there with her, you know, I don't know, does that mean when he goes to the bathroom, she's, she's not a princess, or when he comes back, she becomes one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's quite crazy. Yeah. And then, but then you have Princess Diana, who is still called Princess Diana, even after she and Charles divorced. But I think. Actually, technically, she was no longer part of the royal family after they divorced. So after she was killed, the, Roy the Buckingham Palace did not lower the flag. They didn't do any kind of acts of mourning for Diana because she was no longer a princess. And so some of the Brits got really upset with the with the royal family because of that. Yeah. Because they, they labeled, they still labeled her a princess at that point. And the royal family didn't. Look out, you can get in big trouble. <laughs> yeah. Were you in New Zealand when all that happened? Yeah. And we're, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then how they treat each other, and you know, and then I mean, she surely is gonna princess. The mourning for Princess Diana, who's no longer a princess, is certainly going to be greater than the mourning for Prince Charles. Yeah, but anyway, that's their business. <laughs> enough problems <laughs> yeah I don't need that problem <laughs> okay here's another Nagarjuna cite quote a doer is dependent on doing and doing also exists dependent on just that doer except for dependent arising we do not see a cause for their establishment Okay, so going and go, goer, okay, you know, all these things exist dependent on each other. And without that mutual dependence, then a cause for their, we do not see a cause for their establishment. Yeah. Uh, that was from the Karikas. So uh, failing to understand mutual dependence can lead to all sorts of incorrect views. So, for example, the Vibhasakas and the Satantrikas say that these smallest partless particles are real, even though they don't have any parts. So how are you going to identify something that has no parts? How are you going to point to where it is if it doesn't have any points, parts? Yeah, because it's, that means it has no right, no left, no top, no bottom. Yeah, so without any point, any, any directions, how are you going to point to it? Anyway, they say that this is their problem. <laughs> they, they say that these partless particles exist, okay? That they really, truly exist. And that the objects that are derived from accumulating all these partless particles are mere imputations. Okay? So the, the thermos is merely imputed, but the actual 
heartless particles are, you know, inherently existent. Okay, so that that's a big boo boo. Yeah, <laughs> don't hold that view. Yeah. Um, okay. Oh, now here's another interesting thing. Okay, so some people think that words and concepts um, are mutually dependent. You know, words and concepts depend, you know, are posited, or, or put, you know, different words are, po- are made in reference to each other, or different concepts are made in reference to each other. But that the actual object that the words and the concepts referring to uh, are, are not mutually dependent. Okay, so they think that, uh, you know, calling this uh, top and calling this bottom is just the words that are dependent, but there's no actual top and there's no actual bottom that are dependent on each other. Okay, so um, that's wrong. Yeah, so the objects themselves are mutually dependent. It's not just the words, but it's the actual objects, okay? So it's not that the words seed and sprout depend on each other, but the actual thing that is a seed and the thing that is called a sprout, those things are dependent on each other, okay? Not just the words, but the actual objects. Okay, then we get into dependence on mere designation. So this is the, the third level. Okay, so uh, causal dependence is the easiest to understand. When you go deeper into that, then you start getting into mutual dependence. And when you go deeper than that, then you get into mere designation. Okay, or mere dependent designation. Okay, so there, okay, we're talking about basis of designation and designated object. Okay, in other words, there's, um, when we look at this, we say this is a thermos. Okay, this, this is a thermos. This. Okay, but actually, you know, there's a collection of different parts arranged in a certain way, and we call it thermos. Okay, there's nothing in this that is a thermos, even though we say this is a thermos. Okay, as if any idiot knew this were a thermos. Yeah, right? Any idiot knows that. (laughs) Yeah, except those that don't, you know. Okay, but we think it has some nature of thermos in it. But actually, it's just a bunch of things put together in a certain order, a certain arrangement. And then based on the function that that thing does, we collectively and completely dependently made up the name thermos to identify this. But when we say thermos, we don't see thermos as just a name that we're you that we're calling this, you know, to identify this. We think there's an actual thing inside of it that is a thermos that makes it a thermos, such that we don't even need to learn the name thermos because when we see it, we know it's a thermos. But in actual fact, we had to learn the name thermos, didn't we? And we had to learn the definition of a thermos. But after we did that, we forgot 
that we had to learn that and that we made up that definition and that word. And instead, we think this has some thing in it that is a thermos, some thermos quality in it. Okay. But... Yeah, what are we going to point to that is the thermos? Yeah, is this the thermos? Is this the thermos? Now you might say, oh, this is the thermos because it's bigger than this. This we wouldn't say is a thermos. We'd say this is a thermos top. This we might say is a thermos. But if... There were no thermos top. Could this be a thermos? No, because it would be incapable of keeping liquids warm. And a container that keeps liquids warm or cold is, you know, the quality, the characteristics of a thermos. So this alone, one part alone, doesn't make it a thermos. You need this, too. Yeah. So it's very interesting. If you hold a flower, you know, and you have all the petals, and it's like, this is a flower, right? It looks like a flower. It, you know, it's got to be a flower. Everybody knows it's a flower. And then you pull a petal off. Okay, it's still a, a, a flower, Here's one petal, and here's the flower. You pull another petal off. You pull a few more petals off. At what point does it stop becoming a flower? Yeah? Because if it were really a flower with some flower nature, it should always be a flower and that flower that flowerness should always be there which would mean you could pull the whole thing apart and you would still have a flower but when does that stop being a flower you know now we're all going to have different uh ideas about that depending let's say it's it's a flower with seven petals you know, well, one, you know, flowers have, many flowers have seven petals, right? They always have odd numbers. So you take one, fla one pa petal away. What are you saying? No. Well, my fifth grade biology uh -huh. said. <laughs> <laughs> we would all agree that if you pull one petal off you would probably still have a flower but how many petals if you took two petals off two out of seven do you still have a flower I don't know because two petals out of seven missing yeah would you make an offering of a flower that will a, a seven-petal flower, flower that only has five petals? Would you offer that to the Buddha, saying, I'm offering the Buddha a flower? It's the only one available. <laughs> <laughs> or you'd probably say, I'm offering the substitute for a flower, because this is all that's available. Definitely by four. Definitely have to take three off <laughs> Yeah. So you say th after you get three, three off, off. And, and and with four remaining, it would still be a flower. No. no. Five remaining. I'm going to four remaining. I'm out there. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Oh, okay. So she leaves it down. It can have just two petals. No, it could have three petals. It can have three petals out of seven, and it can still be a flower. 
yeah, tried selling that. <laughs> Try being a, a florist and selling a... a f- <laughs> but people wouldn't call that a flower. They say, you're trying to sell me a flower? That's not a flower. Yeah? Zero. Okay, so zero petals off or zero petals on? Zero petals off. That's okay. Not a okay, so even one petal missing would make it not a flower. What is it? A broken flower. Then it's a flower. <laughs> is a broken flower a flower? Yeah. Uh, uh, is is a is a uh, a punctured tire a tire? Yes. It is. It doesn't function as a tire. It might be able to be fixed. It's a flat tire. It's a. If you called it a flat tire, everybody would know what you're talking about. Yes, everybody knows what you're talking about, but. Technically speaking, is it a fire a, a tire? No, because you ca- you can't use it to to put on your car and make your car go. It doesn't perform that function anymore. Yeah. So it, it's interesting. You know, when does something start stop becoming that? Yeah. Like what's okay? If you say a building fell down, okay, and you're saying a fallen down building is a building. Yeah, it certainly is not going to perform the function of a building. You can't live in it. Okay, you can't even go in it. Other people would look at it and call it a mess. So what's the difference between a mess and a fallen down building? If you say the fallen down building is the building, then the mess must also be the building because both of those are labeled, are designated on the same object. That's difficult. Yeah. If they're inherently existent, you know, you have to be able to find everything. If they're not inherently existent, yeah, you can call that a mess. You can call it a fallen down building. Everybody knows what you're talking about. Yeah. But if it's inherently existent, you know, you really couldn't do that. And, you know, even... it. Even, you know, it's, it doesn't inherently exist. Still, you know, if are we using words correctly to say it's a building if it's just a heap of bricks? Yeah. Because if you said that's the building, then before the building was built, and if you had the heap, a heap of bricks there, then you could say that heap of bricks is a building. Okay. So the point is here, with in, if things are inherently existent, then a name always, there's something has that name and only that name and always that name, you know, and then things really become rather difficult. Yeah. Because inherently existent things are not affected by any other factors. Okay? So, those bricks that were made into a building that now fell down in a pile of bricks would still be a building because it wouldn't call it, they wouldn't be affected by the action of falling, falling down. Okay, but clearly they are. Okay, so another way to talk about this is can we find the true referent of a word 
or a true referent of a name. Okay? It seems like when we are grasping an inherent existence that we can find what that name actually refers to and draw a line around it and hold on to it. Okay? But when we start searching for what a particular name actually refers to, we can't come up with anything. Yeah, the whole thing kind of, it's like sand falling through our fi- fingers, okay? Now, there's the whole thing with the snake and the rope. That's going to be a bit of a discussion. Maybe we should stop here and do the snake and the rope next week. Someone online shared that there's a thought experiment in uh, ancient Greek philosophy uh-huh. that Plutarch uh, thought about. It's called the Ship of Theseus. And it's whether an object that has all of its components replaced remains fundamentally the same object. So it's a little different. So an object that has... In place. In replaced. 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 Yeah. Ah, okay. So uh, what that is like is uh, we talk about Spokane. When was Spokane founded? 18 what? 18 something. Okay. Somebody want to Google it quickly? Find out when Spokane was founded? 1873. Okay. So Spokane founded 1873 yeah so there were buildings there were streets in it okay do any of those buildings exist now that were there in 1873 i don't think so were any of the the roads might have some of the same names but were any of the materials that the roads were made out of the same are any of those Original roads the same in Spokane? No. Do we still call that ta- that city, that town, Spokane? Mm-hmm. Yes. But all of its parts have been totally replaced. Okay. And it doesn't resemble anything like it did in 1873 when there were probably... You know, what, a couple of buildings and maybe some horses and horse carriages and... A tavern. Oh, of course, a tavern. A few taverns. It was a mining town. Yeah. So, one grocery store, 15 taverns. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and a church. <laughs> uh, pro- yeah, probably... No. Yeah, they were the Jesuits. Oh, yeah, there were Jesuits. Right. Okay. Yeah. And a church. Well, you probably have two churches, the one you go to and the one you don't go to. <laughs> okay. And the city had, what, ten residents? <laughs> Something like that. Okay. But, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So everything about the city is completely different. Yeah. Even the dirt that it's on, yeah, all those dirt molecules have been changing a lot in the last what hundred almost hundred and fifty years. Yeah. Nothing is the same. And yet we we say it's Spokane and we think of it as, you know, what is Spokane? It's the second largest city in Washington. Okay? So, I don't know if it was in 1873, maybe, you know. But, you know, we still, we see that continuity, even though everything about the continuity has changed, and we still give it the same name. Okay? Look, look at yourself. Yeah? Your name, you know, okay, your name is Susie Q, okay? So Susie Q, you know, from the time she was a baby till the time she was 99 years old, everything's changed. Yeah, you can't even recognize. 
even from the time Susie Q was 40 till the time she's 99, you wouldn't recognize looking at the pictures. Okay. And yet we say it's the same person. This is Susie Q. Same ID. Yeah. Same ID, different picture. But we think it's the same person. But it's not the same person, is it? Yeah. But if Susie Q lost her, her, uh, her driver's license because she went to too many of those taverns, <laughs> yeah, then even though, yeah, she lost her license when she was 25, when she's 55 and she's no longer the same Susie Q, she still can't drive. You know, she's still experiencing the result of her license getting taken away when she was 25. Okay. Quite interesting, isn't it? Yeah. So even, you know, we think, we look at this now, we say Shravasti Abbey. Yeah, and 25 years ago, you would not call this Shravasti Abbey. Yeah, I think it was built, it was built more than 25 years ago. Yeah, and I forget the name of the people who owned it before the Unruhs. Actually, the Unruhs built it. So you would call this the Unruhs House. Okay, it wouldn't be called Shravasti Abbey. Okay. But if it were inherently the Anru's house, then it could never become Shravasti Abbey. And then it's it's Ananda Hall, and it's also Shravasti Abbey. So which one is it? Because Ananda Hall and Shravasti Abbey are not the same thing. They're different. So which one is this? And where is Ananda Hall? Yeah. Where exactly is Ananda Hall? You know, is it up there <laughs> on the ceiling? Is it down there on the bottom floor? Where, where actually is Ananda Hall? Okay. So th these are the things that when we investigate, help us to see that things exist, you know, by mere designation, not because they have any inherent nature that makes them what they are. A really good example, too, of, is a boat. There's, um, there was a guy, I forget his first name, but Mr. Sloan, who bought a boat called the Spray, and he rebuilt it board by board. It was an old boat. Mm -hmm. And he writes in his book that he's like, it's still the spray, but I don't think there's a single piece that's the same. Right. And then he sailed that boat around the world, mm -hmm. <laughs> and it was called the spray. But it wasn't the same boat. No. Or was it? It was the same shape and everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, are you Brian or are you uh, Venerable Losan? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who are you, anyway? <laughs> Somewhere in there. Yeah? Are you still Brian, even though you've become Venerable Losa? To Yeah, legally, to some people. Yeah. But, you know, people here don't call you that. So no. are you that? Well, my driver's license says that. Says that. What if you try changed your your driver's license to or your ordained name? Would you then be Venerable Losang, or you would be Tupton Losang? You wouldn't have the Venerable on your driver's license. His yeah. Security number would be the same, so he'd still be Brian. <laughs> <laughs> I'd have to change it with that yeah, too, you can but. But somebody uh, that I know would still be calling me. Brian. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, and also there's flowers that don't have any petals. You know these, um, <laughs> the cl clematises? The clematis? 
It's um, in the wild one has got four blue sepals. Oh. But they call them sepals. The sepal is the outer world, like on a rose, it's the green ones. Uh -huh. Then the petals. And somehow they've decided that that flower has four sepals and no petals, rather than four petals and no sepals. <laughs> <laughs> and I can never figure out how they determined that it was the next world that was missing instead of the outer world, uh -huh. especially when they're colored. So, you know. Yeah. So it has an identity crisis, too, like the rest of us. 